For this lecture, we'll have fluidization. First, what is fluidization? Basically, a fluid, either gas or liquid, is passed through a solid material. So there's a bed of solid materials in here. And then there's fluid, typically gas, that's passed through it. And then that is at a high enough velocity to suspend the solid particles. So from a packed bed, it becomes what you call the fluidized bed so that it behaves just like a fluid as well. And typically, at the bottom, you'll notice there are what you call distributors, so that the flow of the gases or fluids will not be localized. It will be distributed throughout the whole area. What's the use typically? They are for chemical reactors, heat exchangers in drying, coating, solidification and granulation, growth of particles, adsorption, desorption, and others. So this is a typical example where they're using the circulating fluidized bed for combustion in the boilers where coal is fed at the, uh, along the side, the bottom, and then there's fluidizing medium at the bottom, typically air, so that it combusts. Going to the advantages and disadvantages of fluidization, for the advantages, number one, it is liquid-like behavior easy to control and automate. There is rapid mixing because you know it's being fluidized. There's uniform temperature and concentration. That's why we, we place what you call the distributor so the flow is not localized. Slow to respond to rapid temperature changes. Useful for large and small operations. And lastly, heat and mass transfer rates are high, requiring small surface much smaller surfaces. For the disadvantages, bubbling beds of fine particles are difficult to predict when it bubbles already. And then rapid mixing of solids cause non-uniform residence times for continuous flow reactors. Sometimes there's what you call particle breakup. And at times, the pipes and wall vessels erode due to particle collisions. This is an example of how the fluidized bed is being affected by increasing fluid velocity. So you can see here from the left of the figure, it's a packed bed or a fixed bed. And then incipient fluidization, just as it begins or just as it is about to get fluidized, you'll notice that's, that there is an increase in the bed height or bed depth. And then once it's fluidized, it continuously moves. So it's a much higher bed height. And then this one, fluid bed in good condition, it's, it keeps on fluidizing. However, sometimes because of too much velocity, what happens is there is what you call entrainment. That's why you'll notice in here, uh, some of the solids would be going out of the column. So once the whole thing the whole batch is being moved out. This is what you, you already call pneumatic transportation. So let's go to this graph. So for the pressure drop versus velocity, you can see here that at A, what are the important parts of the graph? From the start up to letter A, you'll notice that there is a linear relationship just before the bed expands. So just before expansion, velocity is increasing. By the way, this is logarithmic scale. This is also logarithmic scale. Velocity is increasing linearly. And what happens is that at point B, this is where you'll notice the maximum pressure drop. But of course, at a much increased velocity. However, because it's being, um, you know, as you are about to fluidize, what happens is, even if you increase the velocity, the pressure drop will no longer be much present because, you know, air can flow freely. That's why you'll notice there is a decrease in the pressure drop here. So you'll notice that even if you increase C up to D, constant pressure independent of the fluid velocity already. However, sometimes... After point C, after you fluidize, and then what you do is you decrease the velocity a bit, you'll notice that the bed contracts. So bed contraction when fluid velocity is reduced again. This is uh, where a region 
where particles are just resting on one another. So this is the fluidizing point. And then you'll also notice that from E to point F, it decreases linearly. So pressure drop is less than prior to fluidization. So you'll notice that comparing the solid graph here to the dotted graph, to the dashed line, they're both linear. However, the one where you have decreased it, what happens is it's a little bit lower, the pressure drop. Going to the same, this is basically the same as the other one. However, here I'm, I'm showing you entrained flow. Because here, fluidized bed, you, you notice earlier, there isn't an increase already of pressure. But if you further increase the velocity, what happens is you'll notice the pressure drop is much decreased. Why? What happens? Because at the beginning, from a pack bed to incipient fluidization, it starts to fluidize, it increases. Now that it has reached the fluidization stage, um, it will be constant. And if the velocity is further increased, what happens is it's what you call entrained flow or where it spills over already. It, it's no longer kept in the column. So for the behavior and some of the questions that we could ask about fluidized beds, for the behavior of fluidized beds, lighter objects float on top of the bed. For example, objects less dense than the bulk density of the bed. The surface stays horizontal even if the beds are tilted. The solids can flow through an opening in the vessel just like a liquid. So basically, just like what I showed you in here, here, the solids can flow just like liquids. The beds have a static pressure head due to the gravity. So it's given by rho GH. What fluidizing velocity does the bed become fluidized? What is the pressure drop across the bed? And how much does the bed expand on fluidization? So these are the typical questions. In order to fully understand, I'll be explaining some formulas in here. So this is where you'll have, for example, the column. And then this is the packed bed. There's the air or fluid in here at the bottom. This is the bed height. So, of course, if it's flat on a packed bed, you, the inside area will be its area. L times A, length times area, is actually the volume of the fluidized bed. 1 minus E is the fraction of the volume, which is solid. So that means L times A times 1 minus E is the total volume if the solids were all one piece. If assuming it's just one piece. So since the solids volume must be conserved, because you know if you don't spill over anything, the volume of the solids should be conserved. So the volume of the particles initial should be the volume of the particles at any time or basically final. It should be the same. So volume L times A times 1 minus E1 equals L2 times A 1 minus E2. And then area, it's basically the same. So what happens is L1 over L2, 1 minus E2 all over 1 minus E1. So this is one of the relationships between bed height and voidage or sometimes it's called porosity. So this table is basically a relationship of some of the particles and some of the characteristics like particle size, typical char characteristics, particle size, and void fraction. So the minimum bed porosity for fluidization is obtained from experiment data as close to your actual situation as possible. So, so this is for sand, sharp, sand that's round, and then anthracite coal. So how do we estimate bed heights? The bed height is needed in order to size the vessel. Given the total mass of the solids, the cross-sectional area of the bed, or at least the diameter of the bed, the density of the solids. So number one, estimate height of bed if all solids were one piece. So assuming that it's one piece, this happens at porosity of zero. So here, we assume that E is equal to zero initially. So bed height is basically mass of the solids divided by density times area of the bed. So mass, density, area. So it's this one on the right. Number two, determine the minimum porosity from the table. So it's here. 
or sometimes it can be given, and then use the equation for the bed height in this case. So this one was obtained assuming that L2 is the minimum that you are trying to assume. And then here, E1 is assumed to be zero. Therefore, LM is one all over one minus E sub M. For the pressure drop and minimum fluid velocity, the pressure drop across the bed and the minimum fluid velocity must be determined in order to size the pumps. Earlier, we tried to determine the length in order to size the vessel. Now, in order to size the pump or compressor that runs the process. So we need to know the pressure drop. So at equilibrium from batch fluidization, the pressure drop across the bed multiplied by the cross-sectional area, which is the force up, must be equal to the force of gravity, which is the force down, minus the buoyancy force, which is force up. So delta P times A is equal to force of gravity minus force of buoyancy. So you can see in here that across the bed in here, you will be having pressure drop. At minimum fluidization denoted by subscript M, the volume of the solids, if it were one piece, is given earlier by this formula. And then the mass of the solid, basically, this is a volume multiplied by density of the particle is actually the mass. So the gravitational force downwards is the mass times g. And then if there's correction factor, it's g over gc. So you'll notice that the formula above and the formula below, basically the same. It's just that below, it's not because of the particles. It's because of the fluid, the density. So when you combine them, using this relationship, force of gravity minus force buoyancy, what you'll notice is basically it's just L sub M A one minus E sub M density of the particles minus density of the fluid G over G C. So this is the general formula. So do take note that this does not include viscous drag on the particles. This is included implicitly in the pressure drop. In here, we were able to approximate the pressure drop. Now we'll try to solve for the minimum fluid velocity. So there's quite a bit of formulas in here. Uh, the most commonly used approach to estimate pressure drop in the packed beds is due to the Ergon equation. So it's still roughly the same. It's just that this one already incorporates the length the velocity, the viscosity, the diameter of the particle, the sphericity, and then the porosity. So those are already included in here. So you'll notice the pressure drop times GC over the length, 150 mu times V sub O. So basically that's the uh, fluidizing velocity typically or any velocity that you want to solve for. 1 minus the porosity squared, and then sphericity squared, diameter of the particle squared, and then the porosity cubed. You'll notice that I separated those terms with porosity on one side so that when we approximate later on, when we solve, it's going to be easier for us. The terms with porosity are separated. So this is combined with the equation from the previous page, which is this one. When you combine this, what happens is you'll end up having this equation. So this equation includes viscous drag on the particles in the bed because uh, the viscosity is already in here. So please take note of the Ergon equation, this one. Sometimes um, for minimum fluid velocity, if you are given the Reynolds number, so Reynolds number sometimes, of course, it's N, R, E, or sometimes it's simply R, E. The minimum fluidization velo uh, Reynolds number is dV rho. Here, it's the minimum fluidization velocity, density of the fluid over mu of, of course, of the fluid. The equation from the previous slide, which is this one, can be changed into this one, into the bottom one. What is nice about this is look at the note. If the Reynolds number is less than 20 for small particles, then the first term in the equation is negligible. So it's this one being cancelled. Whereas if 
the Reynolds number is greater than 1,000, the second term becomes negligible. So do take note of this. Next, if the terms E sub M and or sphericity are not known, then a reasonable estimate is this one. If you're not given them, this is approximated to be 1 over 14, and this one is approximated to be 11. So that when we plug it in, the given equation here, what happens is 33.7 squared plus 0 0.0408 diameter cubed times density times density of the particle minus density of the fluid G over viscosity squared raised to 1 half minus 33.7. So it's approximated to, into that. Now let's go. You've seen something like this earlier. I've shown you that at increasing gas velocity, this would be the diagram. So from a fixed bed, um, this one would be where incipient fluidization happens. So it increases a bit to, you know, to, to provide some space for fluidization. And then um, this one, it's the bubbling regime already. This is a bit turbulent already. So from a fixed bed, gas phase, it starts to increase in height and then it starts to bubble. Here, it starts to slug. And then as it becomes more and more turbulent, this one would still fluidize, yes, but then some entrainment will happen. That's why some of the solids would go out of the vessel until when it's really, really fast, it would be pneumatic transport. So some of the flow regimes are as follows. If your velocity is greater than zero, but less than the minimum fluidizing velocity, it's a fixed bed. Particles are quiescent, gas flows through interstices. Whereas if it's greater than the minimum fluidizing velocity, but less than the minimum bubbling velocity, this one, you'll have the particulate regime. Bed expands smoothly in a homogeneous manner, top surface well-defined small-scale particle motion. And then you'd have the bubbling regime. Um, if it's greater than the bubbling, but less than the slug velocity, so gas voids from near distributor coalesce and grow, rise to surface and break through. And then in here, you'll have the um, slug flow regime. You'll have turbulent fluidization regime, turbulent regime, fast fluidization, and pneumatic conveying. So these are the different flow regimes and how they appear and basically the descriptions, the features. It might be wise to know like the differences. So in a particulate fluidization, as the fluid velocity is increased, the bed continues to expand, just like what I've been saying, and remains homogeneous for a time. The particles move farther apart and their motion becomes rapid. It becomes fluidized. However, beyond the minimum fluidization, the particle separation increases with increasing fluid superficial velocity. And then the pressure loss across remains constant. This is what I was saying earlier that what happens is the pressure still remains constant because, you know, it can move freely, a bit more freely as compared to this. The increase in the bed voidage or porosity with fluidizing velocity is referred to as the bed expansion. Um, what do you expect from here? The expansion is uniform. The average bed density is uniform at a given velocity and same in all regions of the bed. This type of fluidization is very desirable in promoting intimate contact between the gas and the solids. And liquids often give particulate fluidization. In here, you've seen these formulas before, the first three. For gases and liquids, when the Reynolds number of the particle is less than 1, it can be approximated by this one, the relationship. Whereas for liquids, where Reynolds number is greater than 1, use the equation proposed by Lewis, Gilliland, and Bauer. So this one would be a good approximation. So m, you'll notice there's an exponent m here, can be approximated once you know the Reynolds number. So exponent m in correlation for bed expansion is given by this figure. And then you also have some approximations by Richardson-Zaki equations. 
where for Reynolds number greater than 500, n, that exponent, is equal to 2.4, Reynolds number less than 0.3, n is equal to 4.65. Also, another correlation is the Kahn and Richardson correlation, but this one uses another constant. What you'll notice there is it has the Archimedes number. For the Archimedes number, basically this, this one, this small d is particle diameter. Sometimes it's written as capital D, sometimes it's written as small d. But then in here, because it's written as small d, so I wrote small d as well. Let's go to bubbling fluidization. In bubbling fluidization, the gas passes through the bed as voids or bubbles, which contain few particles, and only a small percentage of the gas passes in the spaces between the individual particles. The expansion of the bed comes mainly from the space provided by the bubbles. The expansion of the bed is small as gas velocity is increased. The dense phase does not expand significantly with increasing total flow. And lastly, most of the gas is in bubbles. Little contact occurs between the individual particles and the bubble. So when you compare this with the fluidized bed, it's better to have like particle, particle fluidization in here in the particulate regime so that the gas would be in contact as much as possible with the small particles. Whereas in the bubble bubbling regime, you'll notice that the bubbles form here, in here, and then it would actually just escape. It will not be in contact with the other particles here. In bubbling fluidization, the gas passes through the bed as voids, so just like what I have said earlier in here, and then it would just uh, erupt from the surface, not coming in contact with most of the other particles in the bed, you'll notice here. The interstitial gases, you'll notice, are these. We would want this to happen where there's good particle distribution and good gas distribution in between the particles. So for bubbling fluidization, in order to estimate minimum bubbling velocity or UMB, it is uh, given to us by Geldart and Ab Abramson. So minimum bubbling velocity is 33 dp times mu over rho raised to negative 0 0.1, where d is the particle diameter, mu is the gas viscosity, and rho is the density of the fluid. However, please do take note of the following at the bottom. If the calculated value, VOM, is greater than the calculated UMB by equation 342, then the calculated VOM should be used as the minimum bubbling velocity. However, if the calculated velocity is greater than the VOM but less than the uh, bubbling velocity, it's non-bubbling fluidization. So it's still in the uh, particle fluidization. In here, if the VO is greater than the MB, UMB, it's bubbling fluidization. Whereas if VO is equal to UMB, um, it is bubbling but for group B powders. So Geldart has categories of different powders. So how do we solve for VO in the bubbling regime? So the velocity is equal to the fraction of the bed times the bubbling velocity plus 1 minus the fraction of the bed times the minimum velocity. So here you've uh, seen something like this already earlier, but then it's mostly with the porosity. So L LM is equal to L times 1 minus the fraction of the bed occupied by the bubbles. Here is the relationship between L and LM. So for group A powders, where the minimum bubbling velocity is greater than the VOM, what happens is you'll observe bubbling and non-bubbling fluidization, whereas for group B powders, you'll experience bubbling fluidization. Also, some approximations are as follows. Bubbling is 0 0.7 times the square root of G times the bubble diameter. So given by McCabe. All right. So this graph basically just shows us the different uh, groups according to Geldart. This was already reported. There are uh, groups A, irritable, B are sand-like, C are the cohesive powders, and D are the spoutable. So this is basically 
particle size versus the density. So this is the simplified figure, particle size versus the, the difference in the densities. So what are the following groups according to the classification? For example, let's take group B. The most obvious characteristic starts bubbling at the minimum fluidizing velocity. The typical examples are the sand, the building sand that we use. And then how does it expand moderately? And then the aeration rate, it's quick. The bubble properties, no limit to the size of the bubbles that they could form. And then, you know, so please study this, the, the different classifications according to Wildar. So this one, an example of an attempt to fluidize group C powder producing cracks. Imagine, parang, kasi isn't it that C is cohesive and difficult to fluidize? So flour and cement, so they are together, they're very small. And then the properties, it's, it takes a lot of velocity, input velocity to, to push this. And then what happens is you'll notice that this one produces cracks and then it separates. Whereas group D powders, sample group D coarse solids, gravel, coffee beans, this one produces uh, basically parang channel localized to flow pushes the middle but then the sides are not are not being pushed so this one's it's difficult to fluidize as well that's why there are distributors sometimes you know distributors are placed in here across the whole cross-sectional area so that the fluid gets distributed evenly not just at the bottom here